We're going to keep going in the Holy Spirit series this, this week, and um, I hope you're not getting spirit fatigue uh, <laughs> on this. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty lengthy series, and, and we're doing that for a reason, because we're going to work into, we got a, a, a series in, in July uh, on Psalm 107, just we're going to stay right there for four weeks, and, and then we're going to move into in August, we're going to talk about how does God speak to us? How, and we, we know that God speaks, but I, I don't know of a Christian, including myself, that doesn't struggle at some times, uh, and, and maybe a lot, with is that me talking or is that God talking? And we're going to spend a, a, a number of weeks in August and September on how does God speak to us? How does He speak through His Word? How do we interpret that? But the critical mass is the role of the Spirit plays. That's why we're spending so much time on that, because the Holy Spirit, He has um, a lot, to obviously, to do with that. So uh, we're going to talk about a different attribute of Him today with the idea of conviction. And I'm going to talk to you today about the compassion of His conviction. The compassion of His conviction. You know, Jesus, Jesus Christ is the most controversial figure in human history. Seminaries and universities have been launched in his name. Songs by the thousands have been written about him or have included him. No telling how many thousands upon tens of thousands of books that have been written about Jesus. In the Bible, there's over 150 adjectives trying to describe Jesus, most likely because he's unable to be described accurately. Jesus is the most controversial figure in in human history. And when you look at all that he did, there's one thing that he really could not do in human form. He was the God-man, fully God, fully man. But when he came to earth, he was at one place in time. He was at one place in time. The Bible says he chose to limit himself. He was at one place in time, but when the Spirit came... When the Holy Spirit came on to the scene, he went from a place in time to everywhere all the time. And part of that ministry that he gave us in that is the idea of the convictor. So let's look in John 16. That's where we're going to turn this morning. John chapter 16. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus is in this discourse about the role of the Spirit and It's some sweet words that he tells us, probably something that you really don't hear a lot about, the personality of the Holy Spirit. We know a lot about the comforter and the helper and all these things, but this is a little different. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit in John 16, and we're going to pick it up in in verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, he will convict the world. Now he qualifies it. He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And whatever, excuse me, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose, it's important you know that word, he will disclose to you what is to come. And he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So Jesus has a role, obviously, to tell us that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. And the question really becomes for me, why would God go through this kind of 
pain, if you will. Why would he go through this kind of labor to, to bring a Holy Spirit into our lives? And I really believe when you look at the overtones of the Gospel of John and the overtones of the Bible, it's pretty clear. Why would he go through all of this effort to make sure that we have a convicting agent? It's because of his compassion. His compassion fuels his conviction. His compassion fuels his conviction. If you look at the overtones of Scripture, like think of a verse in 2 Peter 3. I love this verse. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. In other words, God's time is not our chronological time. But it, He is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In the heart of God is that we come to a place where we can repent. That's his love for us. If you look at the Gospel of John, I, I love how, how John opens his Gospel, man. You know, because you, if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's obvious that Jesus had friends even among friends. Jesus had the twelve, and then he had Peter, James, and John, and then he had John. And just look at the difference in the way that John opens the gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the synoptics, what do they do? They talk about the birth narratives and they kind of walk you through that. What does John do? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And he came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. But to those who did, they became the children, the sons and the daughters of God. He, he dwelt among us and pitched his tent. I mean, John, he doesn't even go. With, I mean, it is a complete, he knew the man. I mean, he knew the man. He knew, he knew deep parts of his life, you know, and you look at what John said, but what does John say in, in, even in the first chapter? He came to us and he pitched his tent. He made his dwelling among us. Why? Because his compassion. It was God's heart that none should perish. His compassion fuels his conviction. So the Holy Spirit, why does, he, why does he go about convicting us? Well, he has a ministry of that. We're going to talk about that here now, and let's, let's kind of break it down. His compassion is to expose universal guilt. That's where it starts. Jesus talks about that in verse 8. Compassion to expose universal guilt. He said, now when the helper comes, what will he do? He will convict. He's the convictor. So the Holy Spirit is a convicting agent of God. And he'll convict the world to start out concerning sin. Universal guilt. So in effect, what the Holy Spirit does is he extends the ministry of Jesus, right? He extends the ministry of Jesus. He, he goes from being at one place in time to being everywhere all the time. When Jesus came into the world, it was a dark world. His presence made everything light. I mean, there, you know, you can take the darkest, darkest, darkest night. And even take the light on your phone, and everything changes. Light penetrates darkness every time. Every time. I love what John, uh, Jesus said in John 15. He said, but all these things they will do to you, talking to the disciples, for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. You see, his light made it impossible for the darkness. It made it impossible. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 1, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not comprehend it. In other words, it couldn't overwhelm it. It couldn't overpower it. The presence of Jesus made darkness put into perspective, if you will. He extends the presence of Jesus. You see, God's presence across the world is exposed. And when he comes on the scene through the power of the Holy Spirit, the whole world is put on notice. We are sinners. We are sinners. And that's what he does. He exposes universal guilt with no question anymore. But he tells us, you need me to leave. He just said it to you. It is better for you, in verse 7, that I go away. Because right now I'm at a place in time. But if I go away, I'm everywhere all the time. And therefore, I will be ongoing, not just in the days that Jesus walked the earth, but Jesus walks the earth now. 
through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Convicting all of humanity about their sin because of his love. His love drives it. His compassion fuels his conviction. But that's not all it does. There's a little bit of a different verse here in verse 8. It says, he convicts the world of sin and of righteousness. And then Jesus qualifies it in, in, in verse 10. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. He's talking to the disciples. You see, his compassion is there to validate the Son. It's there to validate the Son, to make the Son known that He was who He said He was, He is who He said He is, and He validates it. Now, last night, I got to do something like just, you know, wicked cool. Um, I got to go to a U2 concert. Yeah, baby. Um, Now, that may not mean much to some of y'all, but to a child of the 80s, I mean, that's like everything. You know, I remember I was in, I was, I was in eighth grade, I was in eighth grade, and um, I was, you know, I remember my, my dad talking about the first time he heard the Beatles, and uh, I, I was like, wow, that must have been pretty, pretty neat, you know. I, I remember hearing uh, Clapton talk about the first time that he heard, that he heard um, uh, Jimi Hendrix on the radio, and, and, he had, and he had to pull over. And I remember hearing him, even hearing Clapton talk about how the first time he went to a Hendrix concert, he said, I had to leave. This is Eric Clapton talking. I had to leave because I either had to admit I wasn't that good or I had to run from it. So I chose to run. (laughs) I never had any experiences like that. But I remember walking, we, we went down to see Dr. J's last game uh, in Atlanta. Not his last game, but he was on his last tour with the Sixers, and it was his last game in Atlanta. I got to see Charles Barkley when he was skinny. I mean, it was, it was great, um, and, and it could rebound. And, and, and so um, we're, we're walking the hallway. So uh, our math teacher, Ms. Hazelwood, took me and Chris Rickman and uh, Mr. Hazelwood, and she wasn't that old. We called her, but she was only like in her you know, late 20s, but she took us down there. And I was walking through the, this mall. We had some downtime, and I was walking through this mall, and I pra- passed this record store. Okay, so that's this vinyl thing, students. What they did was they would burn music into it and press it, all right? And, you would, and then they had cassettes. And, and so I'm walking down through this mall, and I hear this sound. I'm passing Tower Records. And, I, and I'll, I'll go in there and I ask the guy, I'm like, dude, what is that? And he, and he just, he literally grabs the tape and he puts Joshua Tree in my hand. And I look at it and I pull out my wallet and I buy it. And I go home and I play it. And, and from that day as an eighth grader, like I, the U2 was always, even from the time they were in their early 20s, they were a band of social justice. And, and they fall on different sides of that at times. I don't agree with some of that stuff. But, you know, especially recently in some of the things they're standing for. But, but, but that band has always been uh, huge. In, and, and, and also because, like I said, because of, of they put their money where their mouth is with poverty and, and all those kind of things. But last night, um, you know, we're sitting there and, and <clears throat> there's, there's, they're, they're highly interactive with videos and it's really cool presentation. And, <clears throat> and then there's this, they begin to show, they're singing a, a song about peace and, and, and some harmony and, and they begin to show video captured during the Charlottesville times of the Nazis and, and uh, the, the, America, the protests for white power and supremacy and, and all that. And, and the, the torch when they all like lined up. And, 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 and I'm sitting there and, I, and, and, and first of all, you know, it, was, it was painful to see that. Because you, you see Americans, you know, young, bright-eyed Americans and, and, and you see their faces and, and the, the hatred and, and, and all, the, all, the, all the, the, the crowds going at each other. And, but the thing that, that I couldn't walk away from was I don't even know anybody like that. Like if I was a Martian, like I'm not, and some of you might think that I am, but, I, but if I was a Martian and, and I listened to a 24-hour news cycle about America. I would be convinced we are, we, sh- we are the most hateful people in the world. Evidently, we battle hatred just constantly. And that's not true. Like, I mean, I know that there are people out there like that. I've never even met anybody that I know of like that. But if you listen to the media, it's, it's like a done deal. 
It, it's, it's convinced, convincing that, that this is a lot of the American culture, and it makes me want to go to the whole world and say, don't believe that. That's not my people. That's not who we are. Oh, yeah, there are people, but there are people in your country, too, that feel that way. Every race has racism. Not just, it's not just America. I mean, it's all over the place, but that's not my country. That's not who we are. But if you listen to the narrative of the media, it's convincing. And it made me think a lot about Jesus Day, actually. Because I've been thinking about this whole thing for weeks, of how the Holy Spirit validates the Son. And really, a lot of the same tenets were there in Jesus' day. Oh, it was a completely different issue than what we saw in Charlottesville about a group of messengers sending a message. See, there, were, there was a lot of people waving branches, calling him Hosanna. He's going into town. This is the Messiah. He's all these things, and he's wonderful. But then there was this one group of Jewish leaders. And they said, oh, no, no. No, you got it wrong. No, he's got to die. He can't say that. He can't say he's God in the flesh. That's blasphemy. He can't do that. Yeah, but he's raising people from dead. I don't care. Like, he's walking on water. I don't care. He's fulfilling prophecy. I don't care. He's got to go. And they kill him. Why? Because this tribe drives this narrative that isn't true. He actually was the Messiah. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He, it says that he convicts the world of sin and he convicts them of righteousness. That I go to the Father and you no longer see me. I have more things to say. You can't bear them now. You see, the overtones of that passage is that I am who I say I am. I did what I said I was going to do. I will come out of the grave. He does. But the whole world is, 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 is in many ways misinformed about who Jesus is. They were told a lie. They were told a lie, and they believed it. Now, if you, you want to see the power of that, well, it's, I don't want you to turn there, but I just want you to listen. If you want a really good study sometime on a side note, contrast the life of Peter before Pentecost and after. It's fascinating. This man. So Pentecost comes in Acts 2. Don't, don't turn there, just listen. Suddenly a violent rushing wind comes. The Holy Spirit, they're filled with the Holy Spirit as promised. They begin to speak in tongues as, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then it says people were amazed and they said, what? what's going on? They're, they're, they're all, this doesn't make sense. Verse 12, chapter 2, and Acts 2, 12. And they, they continued in amazement with great perplexity. What does this mean? Some were mocking them, saying they're drunk. And Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and says to the whole crowd, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my word. Give heed to my words. These men aren't drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what is spoken of in the prophet Joel. It shall be in the last days that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He goes on down. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men. This is no coward anymore. No coward anymore. He's saying it in front of a bunch of Jews. They just killed Jesus. What makes them not going to kill you too? But God raised him up, putting him putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him, for him to be held in its power. And then I love what the last thing he says. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Man. I mean, that's a different guy than uh, I don't even know you. Right? That's a different man. 
You see, he was telling them, no, I know what you heard. I know what you've been told. I know what the mob told you. But let me tell you, you killed him. That was the man. He was validating the son. The Holy Spirit gave him power to validate the son. The Holy Spirit does that with us. He validates the legitimacy of the son. Oh, I know the message you were told. I know what the small mob wants to tell you that's wrong with everything. But let me tell you what's really going on. That was the son and you killed him. But God brought him up from the dead. The Holy Spirit does that. Have you ever noticed? Isn't that ever, doesn't that ever like perplex you a little bit? Uh, how much tension is around when you mention the name of Jesus at all? Like if, if I were on some talk show or on some radio show today and, 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 and people, are, you know, maybe as an author or something, and, they, and I was really into Buddha, people go, oh man, he, he's enlightened. Gosh, that guy, he's, he's wicked smart. He's current. If I was really into mysticism, if I was really into, you know, some type of Eastern religion, oh gosh, that guy's so spiritual. But let me say I'm a Jesus follower. Oh, you're a hater. Now, hold on a minute. This, this man was the friend of sinners. Like prostitutes felt comfortable walking up to him. How's that bad? Evidently, people that were very much not like Clearview people, that hang out in way different realms than we do, they were like, hey, Jesus, want to come to our party? I mean, I haven't been invited to a party in a long time. I don't know what that says about me. Jesus was a friend of sinners. But it's amazing. Invoke his name and watch the conversation turn. You know why? Because you see, when the friend of sinners is around sinners, well, it does something, doesn't it? Because now all of a sudden you realize just how much of a sinner you are. His light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. See, you're forced to deal with it. You're forced to deal with it. When the light shines, you have no way around it. His convicting agent convicts the world because it has to. It's, it's who he is. He validates the Son because of his standard of perfection. That's not all he does. I would also say to you today that the Holy Spirit has compassion to permanently deplete the power of evil. He's a convictor. Now, Jesus said, Jesus said he's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and what? Judgment. And then he qualifies it in verse 11. He, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Perfected tense. It's done. It's over. It, it, there's no going back at all. You see, the cross was God's, listen, the cross was God's concrete judgment on the power of sin. The argument is settled. And his love, well, his love, his love drove him to that place. You see, it would have been enough. The Bible tells us in, in, in Romans 1 that creation itself was enough to leave people without excuse. In other words, creation was God's first missionary. Creation itself was enough. See a sunrise? Every year, ducks fly south. Every year, same place, right down the flyway. Every year, nature has order. The sun rises. Earth spins on its axis. Weather changes perfectly. Why? There's a creator. Creation itself was God's first missionary. But God doesn't stop there, does he? No, he sends Jesus and injects him into time. The Bible says at just the right time. And, he go, and if that weren't enough, he goes to a cross. To die for my sins. Of and if that weren't enough, he, he, he comes out of the grave to show power over death. And if that weren't enough, he sends a Holy Spirit as the convictor of God. He's a thorough God. Why? Because his compassion fuels his conviction. He wishes that none should perish. And he's going to go to every mile to make sure that it happens. And, he's, and even to the point of sentencing the devil Calling that permanently done. Now, I, 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 uh, I certainly not an attorney. I mean, I took a business law course once. I don't know what that means. Um, 
in uh, my undergrad, I did a lot of um, com- uh, community corrections and, and probation parole things were part of sociology, and, which is what my undergrad was in. But I did study it a little bit, and it was, some things were fascinating. And, 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 and you, you probably already know this, but in case you don't, you know, there, there is a difference between conviction and the sentencing process. Those two things are, are, are entirely different. Con- in, in the conviction process, a, a law has been broken. It has no character to it. It's not emotional. It, it is like, look, this was the statute. You broke it. Done. That's it. I mean, there's no, there, that's, it is what it is. There's no emotion there at all. So once it's been determined that, that a law's been broken, doesn't matter who you are, law was broken. Now, you move into the sentencing phase. Now, it's in that, it's in that phase that, that there can be a little bit of discrepancy based to, on the judge. So let, let's say that a person be, gets mad at a football game and some dad makes another dad mad and, and the other dad just just. just hammers the other guy and beats him, doesn't kill him, but really messes him up, and, and he's going to have to go to jail. Well, a judge has the right to look at the history, and you say, well, you know, he's done this before. Okay, well, the maximum sentence, he's going to get it. I mean, he's got a history of violence, and, you know, but, but if he's never done that, and he's been a good citizen, and, 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 and this was a, an isolated event, there, the judge has some ability to look at his character and say, well, there's a five-year sentence. I'm going to reduce it down to 18 months and time served and, and whatever. So there's a little bit of leniency there. But you see, it's not, it's not so with God. Because conviction and sentencing, it's a total and full and completed action. Because there's no one righteous, no, not one. You can't be so bad, but you can't be anything good. It, 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 you can be as good as you want to be, but it's never going to be enough. And so, so what God did in his thoroughness, in his compassion, he went so far as not only to stamp out the powers of evil, but to also send that convicting agent throughout the world, even into our lives, because we're all guilty. When we had to have Christ, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. It took Jesus to make that happen. He depleted all the power of evil on the cross and at the open grave. There's no relativity with it. He's going to convict us because we deserve conviction and we deserve sentencing. And his compassion enters into the game and says, no, I want that none should perish. I remember in the, in the eighth grade, I, I uh, tell middle school stories this morning for some reason. I don't know how that's happening. But I remember in football, um, my football coach was uh, Frank Mullins. And Coach Mullins was an amazing man. He, uh, he was probably in his early sev- uh, late 60s, early 70s. He was my dad's best friend. I actually died in my dad's arms. They were having lunch, uh, eating a Subway sandwich one day at a pavilion in Tullahoma. And Coach Mullins had a real bad heart. He, he was in great shape, but he had to be. He, um, he had a very weak heart. And, and, and it, it, that was back in the, you know, the, the 70s and 80s when, when doctors, if you had like a big heart issue, doctors would say, okay, look, here's the deal. Like, go home, sit in the recliner, don't move, maybe you'll make it. So Frank Mullins said, yeah, uh, yeah, no, how about that? I'm uh, not doing that. So I remember at, at, at Coach Mullins' funeral, uh, Jim Porch, he was, Dr. Dr. Porch was pastor of First Baptist Tullahoma. Then, then he became the uh, executive director for the Tennessee Baptist Convention for a long, long time. And Dr. Porch, I, I still remember as, an, as, a, as a, a 14-year-old boy, uh, Coach, uh, Dr. Dr. Porch saying, Frank Mullins lived until he died. He lived until he died. I thought, that's, 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 that, uh, that stuck with me. He, he had every reason not to invest in boys like me and f- coach football because they said, Frank, you're going to get upset one day and then you're going to go to glory, like right there. And he said, well, fine. And Coach Mullins was a, Coach Mullins was a very, um, a very he was, a, he was very uh, welcoming. He was tenderhearted right up until he put that whistle around his neck. And then he broke stuff. At times. But you knew he loved you. I mean, he loved you and you knew it. And he was for you and he'd pick on you, but he was for you. And he held, I forgot for how many years, it was a long time. Like, I mean, no kidding. Like back in the days when they were just had, they had one, uh, the only face mask you could have was a single bar. That was, that was when he played football. And some of the helmets were still leather. 
uh, he held like every NCAA record you could have for rushing. That was my football coach. He was an amazing man. And um, I remember my eighth grade year, I was the middle linebacker. And that was, that was going to be where all the action was. And it, and it was going really good in the first couple weeks of practice until Daniel Ayers moved, moved into Tullahoma. The devil sent him. And Daniel Ayers was from Illinois, and he walks into the first practice, and he hit somebody in a drill, and the whole world stopped. And they moved me to defensive end. <laughs> <laughs> and I was mad because I was an eighth grader, and I, I've, t- tenure determines that I should have that role. So I, I was going to talk to Coach Mullins about it, and I said, and I'm thinking, he's my dad's best friend, and you know, so I go up to Coach Mullins, and, and I said, Coach, I, I want to talk to you. I said, you know, um, I want to talk to you about, you know, me being the, you know, I, I, I'm the middle linebacker. Yes, 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 son, you were, huh? That's when I should have known, right? I didn't, but that, that, that was the first clue, um, past tense. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, this Ayers guy comes in, and he's like, yeah. And, and I began to plead my case, and, and he says, Cruz, let me ask you something. Is he a better middle linebacker than you are? Well, you know, that's irrelevant. And then <laughs> You're a good defensive end. You need to play defensive end. That's where you thrive but he's better. He said, right now, is Ayers hustling more than you are? Well, maybe a little. In wind sprints, is he giving more than you are? Uh, probably. Yeah, I, no, I don't know. Why? You know? And he said, why don't, why don't you do your job? And so I go home, and I tell my dad. I'm like, okay, they're best friends. He comes in my dad's store all the time. Now I'm taking it up higher up you know, selling it. And I, and I say to my dad, dad, like Coach Mullins is yelling at me. I don't know why I remember this so vividly, but I do. Coach Mullins is yelling at me. Like he's yelling at me. And my dad said, that's good. <laughs> then I said, yeah, but like they've moved me to defensive end. He said, yeah, you probably got one move left. And I'm like, well, that's not, I'm an eighth grader. He's, yeah. And then Daddy said something that I'll never forget. He said, son, Coach Mullins yelling at you is not your biggest problem. It's the best thing you've got going for you. And he said, do you know why? At the age of 14, you're not that socially observant. So I said, at the age of 14, rather, I said, well, No, he said, son, him yelling at you is not your problem. Your problem is when he stops yelling because he's given up. He's given up. You see, he's yelling at you because he still believes there's hope. When he stops, you're done. So if I were you, I would go hit that Airs boys in the mouth. That's my dad. Not like figuratively, like with your helmet, you know. I would go get in there and make something happen and save your job. So I did. I mean, I don't remember how it was. Daniel and I are friends. I don't remember how that ever happened. But, but the coach yelling at you. You see, the convicting agent of God, it never feels good in the moment, does it? When the Holy Spirit's grinding on you pushing on you, pressuring you, making you feel the heat. Listen, that's your best friend. Because his compassion fuels his conviction. Let me tell you what you don't want. You do not want Romans 1 to happen to you. That God gave them over to a hard heart and sensuality. You want the convicting agent of God in your life. It's the best friend you've got. His compassion fuels 
his conviction.